All right, it is Friday. It is September the 21st, 2012, and we're on the countdown. It's getting near crunch time. It's getting near the end of September. We've got October, and then November 6, 2012 is Election Day. And what are you going to do? Are you going to not vote as a protest and uh, hope that uh, that sends a message? Uh, I mean, that's what's been going on for the last um, 20 and 30 years. Half the people don't vote. Um, so all these candidates that get elected, you know, they don't feel any shame. And I don't think they would even if there's a 1% turnout. Um, uh, and there won't ever be like 100% non-turnout because the candidate can actually vote for themselves. And I'm sure at least they're mother would vote for them or something like that so so they would still win with one vote and believe me they would take every advantage of it so instead of just not voting how about not voting for the republicans and democrats i'm all with you if that's what your plan is and we do have alternate legitimate choices i'm not talking about people that you know that are like communists or nazis or whatever we're talking about real constitutional americans that are better than the republicans and democrats i mean it's a better choice that you can choose that you might not have known existed. I mean, um, just look at the ballot, you'll see them there, and that's why we're interviewing people, such as Dan Cox, um, who's running for Senate in Montana, and his competitors um, for the Senate bid for Montana is Den uh, Dennis, or Denny Reberg, and also his uh, counterpart there, um, John Tester. Um, and you know, that's the Republican and, and, and the Democrats that, that you're used to seeing. Uh, Dan um, is, uh, you know, a uh, little bit different. It's Dan, D-A-N, Cox, C-O-X, four, the number four, uh, senates.com. And um, so, Dan, it's great to talk to you. And, and we have always started out here, so I guess asking what motivates you, just a little bit about yourself. And so I guess we're not going to stray too much from that, sir. Uh, good afternoon. And what motivates you? And if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, what motivates me is the fact that I've been told my whole life that I live in a free country, and yet there's not one thing anymore I can do without first getting permission from my government, whether it's, you know, owning a firearm or what I can do with my land. And what I've noticed is all the people who are in government, be they Democrat or Republican, they believe in having more power at the government level and less power at the individual level. And I'd like to reverse that. I'd like to see us go back to having individual rights and following a constitutional government. Yeah, those are what I would call typical politicians, but you're not really a typical politician. I mean, or, or could you, is that safe to say? Yeah, I don't think I'm very typical at all. I actually, one of the reasons, of course, I watched from the sideline politics for years, but unfortunately, like a lot of us, until the government comes and really infringes on us, that's when we get involved. But uh, my biggest taste with government is when they were going to try to impose zoning regulations on my property, which would have not only affected... Um, my personal life, but also my business life, because I had a small business on the property that would have been essentially shut down or not allowed to expand according to these new zoning regulations. And so, like like most citizens, not knowing what to do, I, you know, went and spoke with the Republicans, and they really uh, seemed to like the zoning. And so I studied the law and found out that you could do a constitutional referendum, which basically means to repeal a law. And so I decided to repeal our local uh, Ravalli County growth policy, which is what gives authority for them to zone in the first place. Hmm. And in doing so, you have to gather signatures, and once the, you get enough signatures, it goes on the ballot, and then the people get to vote on it. And I led a team of people, and we gathered the signatures, got it on the ballot, the growth policy was repealed back in 2008, and to this day, our local county does not have any zoning regulations. Well, Dan, that is incredible. We have local initiative referendums here in Florida, and I know California does, and there's a couple other states. I think most of them do. If your state doesn't, you might want to elect some people that might uh, make that you know, an, an option. Um, yeah, it's great. It's kind of like a fourth branch of government. Dan, congratulations. That is so wonderful that, that you gathered that, you know, brought that kind of organization to do that. I mean, I've thought about this at the local level, too. Like, you know, 
I mean, if I own a piece of property, should I not be able to do what I, as long as I'm not hurting others on it, I, I mean, or, or, you know, polluting past my property or whatever, you know, um, but I mean, if I wanted to have an auto repair shop on it, should I not be able to do that? If I wanted to have a, you know, nail, whatever, trimming business, if I wanted to grow, um, you know, uh, oak trees on it and sell, you know, oak trees or something. I mean, should I, should any of those, shouldn't I be able to do whatever I want on my property as long as I'm not hurting others? I mean, I, I agree. I agree with that a hundred percent. There's really only one instance in my opinion where you would be precluded, of course, um, other than hurting other people's life, liberty, or property, and that would be if you bought into a covenanted property. And covenants are voluntary, and so that's certainly something you can contract. Like, if you would like to live in a neighborhood that has certain rules... Right, then right. You, that's true. Then you, I agree with you there, yes. Right. Then you can voluntarily opt into it. But from my opinion, if you buy a non covet covenanted property and then the government comes and changes the rules what they've essentially done is stolen value from your property and generally given it to somebody else where that use is allowed yeah i mean life is short the, the earth is i mean you know this whole landscape's probably going to look different a thousand years from now except maybe the pyramids and i, I mean in a couple things maybe mount rushmore who knows what but but i mean basically uh, i mean if you know for this short span if someone wants to do whatever they want on their property i mean that's a whole premise of freedom let them do it i mean you know if you don't like the way you know they could trim their bushes to look like you know evil can evil or something and and you know what that's not going to really bother me i, I mean it, it's i'm you know I, I should build up a privacy fence then if i really don't like it or, or talk to them but it's not something to get in a ruckus about because you're right it, it's i could have a you know um you know mechanic business or something on there so that's a lot of the a lot of small businesses never start because a person might want to sell t-shirts on the side or you know their barbecue or, or whatever you know um cds or tapes or whatever so there's a lot of you know uncapped potential that that is capped right now that needs to be uncapped that uh you know we should open the the gates for i mean that's what you know why it was so exciting back in the day like uh, you know anyone could be open up their like small street business or whatever and improve and now it's just regulated to death you can't do things on your own property i mean you know we have to you're right ask the government for everything and um and <laughs> there's so many people enforcing us in fact it's not just i mean that itself i think no matter what spectrum of the paradigm you're on but i mean um it, it, it's far as like uh you, you know starting your own business also and and, and then that, all the special interests that prevent people from doing it a lot of this has to do with you, you know these um uh, like it's good to have a craft or whatever but you know if, if you belong to some group that's preventing others from competing with you there's a lot of stifling of competition and, and basically what i'm trying to say is like people trying to use the government to instead of protect their freedoms you know stifle other people's freedoms and there's all of that from the FDA to ever, about every department you can think of. Um, you know, people, once they get in the power, they want to keep their monopoly. And then, you know, they make it hard for prescription drugs to get approved, even though, you know, they're, a lot of them are greedy business people themselves. But, you know, it costs like a billion dollars in like 10 or 15 years. Uh, I mean, I'm not against labeling, um, but actually there's a lot of things that, um, you, you know, it's just... Uh, stunted we're stunted the congress has a 10 percent approval rating i mean again you're not a typical politician i mean you're gonna go to the congress um you know representing i guess those ideals and principles that you know made the uh you know entrepreneurial spirit what it is here and um and that also has a lot to do with freedom so i don't think people can separate freedom from economics what do you think about freedom and economics it's not usually like um someone will ask someone to, like um, what do you think about our budget or economics and then they'll ask in a whole separate question what do you think about civil rights and civil liberties and then in a whole separate question foreign policy but you can also you can kind of mix it all up it's all one issue isn't it or what do you think i think it is one issue and you know the kind of the government you were just describing earlier where one company is using the government to get an advantage over another company that would be defined as fascism but i think that we shouldn't break it down into civil rights or economic rights 
I kind of believe there's really only one right, and that right is property. Because whether you're talking about your money, your land, or your body, those things are all things you own and things you have the authority of the use over. And that's where we... I mean, if you but, buy lands, you bought, you got that money with the time you put into it. Exactly. The labor of your hands, you know, the things you're thinking in your mind, those are really all your property. And the less we can have the government infringing on those, the more freedom everybody in America is going to enjoy. And, of course, with freedom comes prosperity. And the reverse of that, of course, is with dependency comes enslavement. You know how many, I mean, I haven't, I probably should Google this. I have looked it up, but I forgot. But how many people have lost their houses because of property taxes or how many businesses that haven't been open because they just find it too erroneous to, to even start it up? I mean, there's, yeah, every everything. I mean, um, we, we have to do, it, it's almost, um, now they want to, you, you know, it, it starts to affect people. I mean, I'm sure the big prescription companies would love to, you know, limit our access to vitamins. I'm sure the big farming companies would love to shut down all the small and mid-sized farms. Um, you know, we have the highest incarceration rate with the drug war. Um, uh, and I, you know what, I'm not, a lot of people assume, you know, that's an issue. Like the only people that want to end the drug war are people that, um, you know, just want to get high and stuff like that. I mean, even people that don't, you have to know somebody that does because over 50% of the people um, have admitted doing that, even like some of our presidents recently. But beyond that, beyond that, I mean, just think about the families that have been torn up, um, husbands that have wives in jail or wives that have husbands in jail or kids that have parents in jail right now or parents, kids, and vice versa um, for having victimless crimes. So I'm saying if there's a victim in the crime, they, you know, should get punished for that. But uh, if there's no victim, I mean, just like prostitution, that's one of those other unenforceable laws. I mean, we have more people in prison per capita than China, Russia, Iran, um, Syria, um, you know, any, any country I can even think of, even Afghanistan, even per capita. Um, and uh, I, I mean, is that, you know, uh, it, they're saying like, oh, we have so much crime in America. Well, the reason why our stats are like that might be because of this drug war. Um, it's not that we're necessarily more evil than other nations or, or stuff like that. Um, I, I don't think so. What do you think about the drug war? That should be the policy that would make sense. I mean, you might totally disagree with me about what I just said, but um, that's uh, you, you know just one sentiment. But what what is your sentiment about the drug war that I'm talking about that has beginning that has begun since Richard Nixon um, introduced it back in the 1970s, over like 40 years ago almost. Well, I guess our first problem is you know Congress has no ability to define war anymore. They don't declare war, and when they do, it's on something nonsensical like a drug. Um, I think what we really need to look at is we need to, for several reasons, get rid of the drug war. One of the reasons is to get rid of the black market enterprise that does bring the criminality. Uh, I know that in high school, um, it was very difficult uh, for most kids in high school to get cigarettes and alcohol because they were legal and had to be purchased with ID at a store and there was no criminal enterprise out there selling them. But on the other hand, they could get marijuana um, in school almost every single day of the week because there is a criminal enterprise pushing it that's profiting from that. And so, of course, I don't believe that, that we should... I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Please continue, but that does make sense. That's a good point that you know shouldn't just fly over someone's head because that's very true. Right, and, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the, the crime that we have is based um, on this, this illegal drug trafficking. I mean, now that they've made alcohol legal, you don't see uh, gangsters and mafia running around selling alcohol anymore and shooting each other up over it. Not anymore, it. but we certainly did. <laughs> yeah, but we did during Prohibition, and, and we are now, you know, with these other with these other drugs. Um, of course, I think, you know, some of the um, illegal alien problems have to do with the same concept because, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of 
people from other countries who are going to, you know, come back and forth over the border selling those illegal substances at high profits, especially when, you know, their country is going to be more lenient on them growing it. And so I think if we uh, got rid of, you know, the war on drugs, and then the other part of that is, is it's not constitutional. I mean, going back to prohibition, we all have to realize that there are only certain powers enumerated to the federal government, which are in Article 1, Section 8. And because there was no power to prohibit alcohol, we had to have a constitutional amendment to prohibit the alcohol. At so, least they did that, even though it was wrong, but at least they went through the constitutional process. Exactly. But it does just go to show you, though, that if they had no authority to prohibit alcohol, then they had no authority to prohibit marijuana. That's an and excellent so, point, too. Where do we get these powers in the federal government? Well, they don't exist. What they're doing is they're usurping the power of the Tenth Amendment. If a power did exist, it would certainly exist at the state level so or with the point, people. Because you're running as a libertarian, and, and a lot of people say, oh, you know, I agree with all the social aspects of libertarianism, but, and, and you know, they basically believe in anarchy. Well, let me ask you this. Who is a real anarchist? The one who does the constitutional process or the one who decides to ignore it? Well, exactly. The, the real definition of anarchy is no law. And what we have now is lawlessness. Yeah, it's lawlessness. I don't know if it's anarchy. It's more like criminality because we, we have laws and they're ignored by our government. So that's not anarchy. It's more like a criminal government that's now um, taking the place of our constitutional government. And and what all? Uh, can, I mean, it's really easy for people to make the difference. I mean, a lot. I think a lot of people realize that they've just, I don't know, are apathetic or, or something. They just don't believe it can be done. I mean, half the people don't even vote. Um, Congress has a ten percent approval rating. I mean, just when you're looking at that ballot, I mean. You know, please, please, I mean, for especially for us who've never voted for Republican or Democrat, please, like, stop making us, you know, suffer like this. I mean, select something different. Um, stop making yourself suffer. I mean, imagine, like, just the uh, the world we would live in, I mean, if, if we just ended the drug war. Like you said, like, a lot, of, we would put a lot of these criminal organizations, if not totally out of business, we would definitely hurt their... Um, th th their business, um, their, you know, black market business. Um, and uh, and there'd be a lot of people that would be freed and families that would be reunited, um, uh, uh, you know, and if they still committed crimes while on drugs, I mean, they would still get prosecuted for those crimes. And then we could have the police, um, y you know, uh, focused on, you know, real crimes. Well, exactly. I, I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we kind of have the apathy in America that we do. I think that what's happening is I think there's a certain um, level of fear that the people in America have with their government, and what they're trying to do is try to just stay below the radar and not get trapped up, you know, in all of these statutory laws that aren't really constitutional. Well, look at the IRS. People fear. I know people have a fear of the IRS. Oh, absolutely, and but, you know, once again, where is the constitutional authority for the IRS? I mean, they're basically the police force for the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a private corporation. It's not even part of our government. Yeah, and we don't, I mean, and that's another thing, Dan, I want to ask about is uh, transparency. Um, and, and, you know, I'm saying all these stats, I, I read, you know, the... the the paper a lot. I, I do a lot of research. I listen to C-SPAN a lot. I, I read books from whistleblowers or people that are ex-government that have spoken out that, you know, have um, a lot of, uh, you know, degrees and stuff like that. So I, I, I know what they share with me. But, I mean, honestly, a lot of stuff I sometimes could say could be mistaken. It's because I don't know all the facts. And, and, and a government that isn't open is um, one that is encouraging people coming to uh, certain conclusions. I mean, I'm just coming to these conclusions because um, there really is no other choice. Um, I, I mean, do, do you think we'd be a st stronger government, um, you know, that's a more open source government? 
Well, I think I think that is our problem. You know, it's a trust issue. I mean, we've gotten to the point now that our government's lied to us so many times that how can we believe them? You know, it's kind of a cry wolf scenario. I mean, how many wars have we been involved in? Well, not even constitutional wars. I guess police actions, but we've been involved in these things on on lies like and we weapons even... of. I mean, some people, I mean, if you were to watch the news right now, or you might not even know that we are in a war. I mean, the media doesn't let people know that there is a third candidate. I mean, the way people are going about their business nowadays, like, we we were almost unaware that we have a lot of people doing, like, eight, six tours or whatever, and, and we're in two, we're, like, in 130 countries. About six of them were actively engaging in combat. And, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I think a lot of people don't even realize that we're even at war right now. Well, that's a very interesting point. And, you know, of course, I talk with a, a lot of Christians, and, you know, they're always worried about this new world order, you know, one world currency, one world government. And, you know, those stats you just said, I think there's 900 bases in about 135 countries, and we're the world's reserve currency. We're the ones who basically run and fund the United Nations. And so, you know, in, in some sense, we are the people who are running the whole entire world. There's no other country that has hardly any bases outside of their own country. Yeah, and we're the ones who are talking about getting, like, the Real ID Act and, and things like that. So we can, just like if you were to look at the book of Revelations, we can make miracles in front of men we can make fire come down from the skies i mean it's just as simple as like a, you, you know a missile or, or a predator drone attack or, or just whatever um you know a, a gps missile or so i mean just one person out there can just put punch in coordinates and say i'm going to make fire come down on that cave and, and 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 it probably could look like a miracle from someone looking back then i mean i'm not saying that that's the exact example but but I mean, it, it's it, it, it's one metaphor that might be able to fit, um, and uh, so but we're not a government like Caesar. So I mean, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but that was an empire. We're a republic, so I mean, we don't have to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's because it, our government's supposed to be run, supposed to be run by we the people. It, it never has been completely yet. But doesn't mean we can't strive for that goal, and then maybe we could have a government that's really just there to protect people's rights. That's a voluntary government, and um, it's just really a nonprofit organization that that people can collectively get together and do things in a voluntary sense. I mean, you know, I'm not well, opposed. Yeah, we we got to remember on that scripture though that Jesus said that he talks in parables so you wouldn't understand and then one day you would understand and you shall be converted. I actually take that scripture to be totally sarcastic. I think he said, give unto Caesar what Caesar's and give unto God what's God's because he knew that everything was God's and nothing was Caesar's. Ah, well, that makes good sense, too. Um, that's a very true point. And, and also, he might have just meant, like, you know, these coins, they're, they're not worth, you, you, you know, um, anything anyway. So, you know, why are you even worrying about them in the first place? Um, and um, so, yeah, the, that's uh, excellent points. And, and also, oh, um, so great, great. Uh, so, um, I mean, well, so... Let me, let me make one more point that we were just talking about on, you know, governments. I think we have to really watch what our government's doing right now because with NDAA and some of these other things, we're actually now writing it into law or um, at least under executive orders and other things, basically that American citizens can be killed, tortured, detained, anything without a trial. And, you know, we've seen these things go on in other countries all over the world. But very few countries have ever been so brash as to put those things in writing. Mm. And and so we're taking things to the next level in this country where we're saying it's now lawful for you to just be punished and detained and even possibly murdered without a trial. Right. I mean, the things guaranteed in our Constitution guarantee us to know who our accusers are, what the evidence is against us to, in order to have a fair trial, um, to have a jury of our peers, to have a speedy trial. Um, 
you, you know, to not incriminate oneself, um, you, you know, and all those things, um, you, you know, and no cruel and unusual punishment. You're innocent until proven guilty, which and, and basic due process. And uh, that's and you, you, the NDAA basically says that, um, you know, any American citizen or person around the world, uh, you know, the whole world is a battlefield. We haven't declared war. Um, even though we haven't done that, and you know the president can just start a war in Libya and uh, without congressional approval, I mean, we're really acting. We're if we're just judging by actions instead of um, you, you know uh, words. Um, we're acting like an empire instead of a republic. I kind of you know I want to be a part of uh, a republic. Um, you know, either that or just a laissez-faire society, but a republic at least. And um, we're definitely we're acting like an empire. I mean, I mean, is that what we want? Do we want to be an empire and have one leader, and then we all just follow that leader? Um, I don't think so. Well, and I'm glad to hear you using the word republic. I was actually in a debate earlier this year with my two opponents, and the Democrat used the word democracy, and so right away, I explained to the audience that. You know, he's obviously no student of the Constitution if he thinks we're a democracy, because we're clearly a, a republic. And well, we're and democratically. He, I mean, I would give it. We're democratically elected republic. So, if people want to be technical, but yes, we're a republic, though, which means we have you know branches of government and a balance of power. Exactly. But you know. Uh, we are a democratic republic, but I think we also have to throw in the word constitutional because really the constitutional part is the most important part because in a democracy, 50 plus one can do anything they want to the other 49. And in a constitutional republic, of course, the constitution is supposed to step in even if it's 99 versus one to protect your rights. Oh, you're right. And, and we also have the Supreme Court there. We have um, two houses of Congress we have an executive branch. We, you know, we have the rule of law, um, due process. So, yeah, it's much more than just you know 50 against one. And a lot of legislation, you know, requires like two thirds of Congress or even sometimes three fourths of Congress, etc. So, I mean, the you know, it's, it's in a sense when people say democracy, I mean, if if that's what they mean is a republic, then that's okay. But, you know, there's a lot of definitions nowadays that go to the premise of a very question that, you know, we have to resolve. Like, they blame, you know, what happened for the bailouts on capitalism, and they're calling what Obama did socialism. If you want to be technical, I mean, what Obama's Obamacare is, is actually fascism, and, 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 same, and that's the exact same thing that happened with the bailouts. Neither of them were socialism or capitalism, I mean, to be technical. That's true. I mean, uh, well, I would say that we've mostly drifted into a fascist society, but we have seen some forms of communism or socialism where the government actually is starting to own parts of businesses, which would be, you know, the strict definition of communism is, is of course, all properties owned by the state. So, Including, you know, people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when I say property, exactly, I mean people, their possessions, land, you know, anything that you could possess or have control over. Yeah, government's legislating, um, you know, when people live, when people die, like what they can do, what they can eat, um, you know, it, I mean, what kind of music they can listen to, um, y you know, what kind of books they can read, um, you, you know, the fair trade of information and and, and things like that. Um, uh, so now what's something like, let's say a couple of things here. I mean, what's, if you could tell us, Dan, what are some of the things that, um, and I hate even using the words like conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, all this, but it, it's what it is nowadays. But to break through that a little bit, if you could tell something to the Republicans that might be disgruntled and also something to disgruntled Democrats, why they should vote for you as the best choice in the current condition that we're in right now and why you would be the best representative possibly for, you know, either a Republican or Democrat, people who still consider themselves one of those two. Yeah, that's awesome. I think we'll start with Democrats. And uh, I guess, of course, these are just rhetorical questions, but I guess if you're a Democrat, you got to ask yourself, are you happy with all of these unconstitutional wars that we're engaged in? 
are you happy with your civil rights being taken away under the Patriot Act or a real ID or any of these other things having drones in the skies to surveil you? Drug war for any capitalism? Yeah. Right. <laughs> are, I mean, these are all promises that you've heard from the Democrats that they're going to end these things. I mean, I remember when Bush was in office, they said they were going to repeal the Patriot Act. Well, hasn't happened. I mean, they haven't got out of those issues itself, like just two issues, the wars, civil right. liberties, and, and, and the drug war. I mean, if the, just those three things were seriously addressed, that could snowball into other things, by the way. And at least, you know, you're going to have a representative who's not going to vote for the NDAA and things like that. I mean... Right now, I mean, that, we've gotten to the point where, you know, we actually, you know, that's something to consider nowadays. <laughs> right. Well, I guess we'll take the Republican side now. Um, and one of the things with the Republican side, of course, is that they want to end Obamacare. Uh, I would say that they are going to trick you. I mean, if you look at who's running for president, his name's Mitt Romney, and he's the father of Romney Care, which was the blueprint for Obamacare. And as soon as it looked like he had the nomination, everything changed. Now he's standing in front of signs that say repeal and replace Obamacare. Yeah. Well, if you truly don't want socialized medicine or fascized medicine, whatever term you want to use, then uh, why would you want to replace it with anything that resembles that? And uh, now... They're going to trick you for sure. I mean, New Gingrich... Bob Dole in the 90s, they were introducing the individual mandate way before Obama ever did. But please continue, sir. Yeah. Well, and so now I just read an article the other day where Romney's come out and he's saying that he would keep big portions of the Obamacare plan. So this is really just a smoke and mirrors game. If you truly want to get rid of Obamacare, you cannot vote for the Republicans because they're going to put in the Republican version of the exact same thing. Or they'll drag their feet and it'll just become permanent and everybody will forget about it. Um, yeah, or they'll say, you know, do the same thing Obama said. They'll say the Democrats prevented us from passing it or, or, or this or that or we don't have enough votes or, or whatever. The same reason why Obama said, you know, why the Democrats are disappointed, why he never, you know, tried for the... Um, public options the same they, they play you in circles like how come george w bush didn't make the tax cuts permanent how come he just made it 10 years because it's so that they could have an election issue 10 years down the line they're more interested in keeping that carrot or the stick in front of you than actually making permanent long-term changes well exactly and on the issue of taxes i mean i think if we could go back to constitutional money and get rid of the Federal Reserve Ponzi scheme, then most of our taxation could be completely and entirely eliminated. And from from that spot, of course, the libertarian premise is the government really can't give you anything it didn't steal from somebody else first. And so one thing that Republicans would be super happy with me is, of course, the level of taxation they would see, but not only that, um, the level of subsidization because I don't believe in any of it. Of course, at this moment, we're so underwater with people being dependent on government that we have to have a strong plan to, to you know, get people off of the dependency of government. But, so what did, you I know... Mean, you want to get complete rid of the income tax. I mean, now, if you're like the corporation for Nike, Apple, or any big business, small business, mid-sized business... I mean, you should just ditch the Republicans and go with this. I mean, I don't see how any business couldn't see that in their best interest, just getting rid of the corporate income tax, the income tax. I mean, I mean, imagine having that on our, you, you know, uh, front post of our country. Welcome to the only country in the world where there is no income tax. I mean, we would have an immigration problem of businesses coming over here. I mean, we really would. I mean, I know that might sound funny, but it's serious. I mean, there, if we were, we would be the only industrialized country, I, I would rather say, that doesn't have an income tax. And Ron Paul so pointed out, like when he was running in 2008, and this was four years ago, so the numbers might be a little different now. But in 2008, he eloquently explained 
that at that time we could have just gone back to 2001 levels and 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 the same funding for government would have been there without income tax. Income tax doesn't really fund a whole lot of our government anyways. Well, maybe we should go over that just real quick. Uh, I believe the numbers this year is there's going to be about $3.8 trillion spent and only $1.1 trillion brought in in income tax. And on the other hand, there's supposed to be about $1.6 trillion left over that isn't paid for. So if you think about it, if income tax were the answer, which I don't believe it is, then these guys really would like to increase your income tax by about 140% in order to balance the budget. Yeah, the only now, reason you, income tax was there was to guarantee um, the money that we could borrow from the Federal Reserve in the first place. It was like um, kind of a um, collateral for the money that we could borrow, and, and, and most of the money we're spending, that we're borrowing with interest. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln that said that, you know, one of the greatest things that the country can do is to print and distribute its own money. Mm -hmm. And that's why we didn't need taxation before that, because they actually made profits off of selling the money to the private banks who then would sell it to you. So essentially, when you got a loan, you were paying into the coffers of the United States. Now the way it works is when you get a loan, they have to print the money in order to facilitate the loan because they don't have it, it's, which it's creates inflation. Cycle. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a trick it, that, that you have to look in the big picture to, to get it. I think another thing a lot of people don't get this business cycle that Ron Paul was trying to mention. It, it's basically, you know, if you ever seen that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, it's kind of like that. It, it's basically... Um, the business cycle is, you know, the, 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 the people who are in the know, the insider tra traders who are connected to the Federal Reserve, they know when a stock's going to go up or when an industry is going to go up. So they buy, um, you know, while the stock's worth less, and then they, they let the prices go up. They also know when it's going to crash. So they sell right before it crashes. And what happens is they make that huge profit because of the business cycle. And then when everything crashes, they've already sold, you lose your money, and then they buy up everything for pennies on the dollar and then just consolidate and, and accumulate more power. And now we all know that, you know, uh, unlimited power corrupts unlimitedly. Um, and uh, and that, that's the real tragedy of the business cycle right there. No, that's true, but I, I would say that that's mostly a symptom of the problem. I mean, uh, the real problem is the fact that, you know, our congressmen have the ability to subsidize or regulate all of these businesses in a way that would help them or harm them instead of just looking after everybody's rights. If they just looked after everybody's rights, then we wouldn't have to worry about insider trading because none of that business cycle you just described would even exist. Yeah, I mean, really, the only people who shouldn't vote for you are, like, you know, the 1%. Um, so 99% of the people out there really, I mean, maybe even more than 99%, um, like 99.9%, .9%, I mean, should really, um, you know, take your vote seriously. I mean, it, it's this is like a legal representation. We're giving you a right to represent us because we are in a democratically elected republic and um, and this is the way we can assert our power to hold um, our representatives accountable. Um, this is the only way they'll be held accountable. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you might feel like, you know, not voting is, is, is the way to go, but, um, you know, and maybe Ideally, in a world, I would agree, a laissez-faire society would be great um, where, you know, the golden rule is the only rule, and we all realize that. But right now, the fact is, like, just like in Nazi Germany, I mean, it, you could have just protested not voting then. But the fact is, you're affected by all these other people that are around you. And so I think right now, the step before that, it'd be in our best interests to get people who aren't your typical politicians, the ones that don't want to run your lives, the ones that want to return power to the people who, you know, in a society, you know, I think, you know, we aren't ruled except by the Constitution. We are guaranteed these natural rights. And, um, and uh, you, you know, I mean, I'm not saying there isn't room for improvement. There, of course, is. But, I mean, right now, we all we have to do is make a decision that reflects 
the polls right now. I mean, Congress really does have a 10% approval rating. There couldn't be a better time. It's just a decision. So, Dan, what is some of your favorite um, uh, historical figures, um, whether they're someone you admire or someone you despise, but just someone that you find interesting that you'd like to share with the audience and, and, and why, sir? Well, before I get to that, and I will get right to that, I just wanted to make one more kind of plea to everybody to realize that no form of government in the history of the world is a good government with immoral people in it. We've proven now, even with our great form of government, that it's completely inadequate um, if you don't have good people at the helm. So I would say voting is the most important thing you can do, and you need to not vote for a party. You need to vote for people who are only considering your individual rights, because otherwise you're going to have a bad government. I mean, I don't want a king, but let's simplify it for everybody. If you have a good king, you're going to have a good government. If you have a bad king, you're going to have a bad government. So if you care about yourself and your individual rights, you better go out there and vote for somebody who's going to be a good person in government. Yeah, so it, you could just, I mean, unless if you just want to be that sacrificial lamb in, in protest, you, you, you know, I, I mean, you know, you can keep saying, you know, I'm, I'm protesting, I'm not voting for you, I, I'm not some part of this society at the same time, you, you know, being trampled right over. Um, I mean, we don't have to be like that. So we can assert ourselves and, and vote for someone. If, if someone is in there that actually represents how we feel, then, um, you know, I think that's a step ahead. Uh, and so don't vote for a Republican or a Democrat. Well, and you have to realize that to some degree opting out would be fantastic. But what they're not realizing is the government's going to come find you and they're going to do it at gunpoint, whether it's the IRS or the FDA or some other bureaucracy. They will force you back into their system, and it's not going to be pleasant for yeah. anybody. And if you opt out, it's got to... The thing about opting out is, and I agree, I mean, it would be great to opt out, but if you opt out, you have to realize you have to do more than just opting out of voting. I mean, if you're serious about opting out, that means you also have to not pay taxes and, and everything else that goes with it. If you choose just to opt out of one thing, like voting especially, then then I, I think you're hurting yourself. Now, if you're truly like an opt-out person who's going to opt out of everything, then you might have something there. But unless if you're opting out of everything, it's not going to work. Right. Well, and as far as, you know, historical figures, I guess uh, the people who I've studied the most is uh, Frederick Bastier. That was one of the, you know, original books that kind of got my thinking in line, uh, The Law. And, of course, his talks about legal plunder and all those things, which are, you know, and he explains property and, and all the necessities of it and, and what is just in property. And so I would recommend that to everybody. And then, of course, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who, although may not have been a perfect president, but as far as, you know, the, the things he wrote and the way he thought... I think we can learn a ton from him, more than almost any other president. I mean, if I'm looking for presidential quotes, nine times out of ten, I'm going to use a Thomas Jefferson quote, because he's got a quote for almost everything that I've ever uh, pondered. No, that's very, very true. I mean, I don't agree that, you know, I wish he wouldn't have had slaves, um, you know, to be right. quite honest. But, you know what? As far as his principles go, um, as far as what he was able to, uh, you know, um, express, um, those principles, whether, you know, it, it, it's more than the man. It's about the principles that, that can live forever. I mean, um, so these, yeah, you're absolutely right. He was a great thinker. Um, you know, he also died in debt, um, you know, and, and a couple other things he did. But but he did, he, he was a civil libertarian, and, and he at least knew the principles about it and were able to express it. And so it doesn't take that part away, and it doesn't mean that it, it makes any of those points any less valid at all whatsoever so um well, well i think you've got to take it kind of like christianity for example i mean 
if you're looking for a church according to a perfect pastor, of course you're never going to find that. What you got to look for is perfect principle, and and so that's what I'm basically saying is that. You know, the the things he taught, although he wasn't a perfect man himself at all, the things he taught were were really sound principle from, from what I've seen. And so, uh, and, you know, like Ron Paul's always said, this isn't about him. It's about the liberty movement and the principle. He's not really the person who's famous. It's just, he's kind of just the, the guy who brings the message, which makes him popular. But he's not popular. The message is what's popular. Yeah, I mean, people found a way, like, people were using him, I mean, in a good way, um, to be the uh, the vessel in, in which um, for freedom could be expressed. I mean, a freedom and, and the truth um, the, the truth found the path of least resistance at that time through Ron Paul. And now imagine having a couple more Ron Pauls, I guess I could say, in, in, in the Congress. I mean, because he's not going to be there next year, and we're also losing Dennis Kucinich and a couple other people. So I think it, it's it's even more urgent now that, we, you know, we have some people to take their place that will stand up against, you know, undeclared wars and uh, unnecessary ones against um, civil liberties and fractions. I mean, it's going to be very important. I, I hope we get, can get about 50, and I don't see any reason, I don't see any con... I'm looking at pros and cons. I, I can't see of any con, um, you, you know, uh, as uh, sl selecting you um, based on what you're standing on. And is there anything that I forgot to mention, Dan, that, that's, um, that uh, you know, we haven't gone over that you'd like to bring up, sir? Well, I think, I think what people need to really understand is that in this Senate race that I'm running, there actually is quite a bit of hope. Um, you know, the first poll just barely came out, and in that poll I'm running at 8%, which may sound kind of low, but if you realize in a three-party race, you can actually win with just over 33 and a third, then I'm not that far off. My opponents have spent, I don't know, somewhere around $12 million. <laughs> I've hardly spent any money. I'm getting into debates. I've been on the radio shows. You know, I'm having interviews with NBC and PBS, and I've, I'm getting all the opportunities. All I really need is just that extra little effort by you to, to tell your neighbor or to Facebook, you know, here's Dan Cox. Yeah, if you five know, people would tell five people and tell those five people to tell five people, it's not, you don't need, like, the, 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 the money. Um, I mean, although it would help. Um, and people should donate, and even if you're not in Montana, you know, I could donate to Dan, right? I mean, it's because he's going to stand up for the things that are important to me, even though I'm in Florida, or whether you're in Ohio or California or wherever you're at, especially, though, if you're in Montana. I, I mean, it, it, it's um, just like I was a fan of Ron Paul, who is in Texas. Um, and so, yeah, five people could just tell five people that could tell five people, and, and uh, I mean, just weigh out the pros and cons, basically. Yeah, I mean, make a YouTube video, promote me. I mean, do anything. It doesn't take a lot. It, in fact, if there's a lot of people doing a little bit, I mean, we, we could do this thing really easy. Um, you know, from a candidate standpoint, uh, you know, a lot of the time, you know, candidates are doing a lot of the work. You know, if, if you want a someone to represent you, uh, really, you need to engage in the system, and you need to go find these people that you want to represent you, and you need to do your little part to get that representative into office. Yeah, it's not about them. I mean, although I think, Dan, you know, I would love to see you in there. It, it's about the people. Use these candidates. Like, propel them. Just kind of like if you're watching football, if the running back has a ball, imagine that offensive line pushing that running back forward. I mean, whether the running back likes it or not. I mean, you know, just let's be that offensive line. Let's us determine it. Let's, you know, take advantage of these um, candidates who put themselves in these positions, and let's take advantage of that. Let's help push them. You know, even if it, you, you know, Dan, I hate to say this, but even if you, you know, get, you, you, you know, hurt going through, I mean, at least you'll get through and you'll have a congressional health care because we need to get these people through there. We need to propel them across that um, end goal and um, end zone. And um, so, I, I mean, and I'm sure you would want us to, to, to push you across, you know, um, I mean, because, I mean, this is, 
And uh, so, you know, I, I have great respect for you, you know, be, and hopefully you're going to be there at the right time, right place to, 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 to be advantage of this because 2012, I don't think there could be a better year so far because of the low congressional approval ratings and, and all the mistakes, you know, from the bailouts. I mean, that's the bailouts were the reason for the Tea Party. They were the reason for the Occupy Wall Street. And I would say this has been brewing up since Ross Perot in 1992. It's just that, you know, the fervor kind of died down a little bit. And like you said, probably a lot of people are scared nowadays because of things like the Patriot Act and the NDAA. So let's vote. Let's um assert ourselves and uh and you know take back our government make it filled the halls of congress filled with people that aren't typical politicians and you know what if this wave of people that we could get our third parties or independents don't do the job we will look for new people in 2014 and beyond but I mean, right. we at least need you know some kind of breathing room at least some kind of something that says you know we're taking um, things back in control and this is a start and this is something that would not be able to be ignored i mean this would get worldwide attention if there was like 50 plus independents and uh, third party people elected um and um so once uh, real quick dan I, w I appreciate your time here and when, when when's your next debates and when can people next see you you know on on a debate well, there's going to be a, a poll released on Sunday, and assuming I get more than 5% in that poll, uh, my next debate will be, I believe, August 8th in Billings. And you uh, should so be able to see that. October 8th, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, October 8th. And then I'm already confirmed to be in a debate in Kalispell, October 14th. And Bozeman, which would be October 20th, is still up in the air there. Um, well, what, trying to push what stations for 10 are these going to be on, and um, and what stations should people call to uh, you, you know um, express their opinions that they want to be able to make a fully informed choice, and the only way they can do that is to know all of their options. So what what you know TV stations or whatever would should people get in contact well, with? Well, for the Billings debate, it's the Billings Gazette that's making the decisions. So. You know, that's who you need to call and say you want to see me in the debate. And like I say, I'm already in Kalispell. Um, and then for Bozeman, you need to call the Bozeman newspaper and, you know, ask for the same thing for me to be in the debate. They're pushing for a 10% poll margin, which I may very well get to. But, you know, the more demand there is, the more likely they are going to be to put me in there. I've already been in one big major debate, which you can actually watch on YouTube or on my website. Great, great. Um, well, I, I mean, that, that goes to the whole thing. How can we make fully informed decisions? We can't unless if we know all of our options. And, and that's not just in these elections. That's in everyday life because our representatives, there's a lot of shadowy secret things going on in government. And, and, and another benefit, whether you're a progressive, liberal, conservative, Republican, is Dan I would assume, Dan. I mean, Dan's going to share more information so we can all make more fully informed choices. I don't believe there's a Green Party candidate running for Senate in Montana, is there? There is not. There's actually only three uh, parties in Montana okay. at this time that have ballot access. And, of course, that's the two uh, Republicans and Democrats and Libertarians. And so other than that, you'd have to be an independent, which... You know, gathering the signatures for that's almost an impossibility. So Libertarian's really the only third-party choice right now in Montana. And so, I mean, if you are a third, you know, a Green Party person out there or whatever, it would be in your best interest. I've seen many fusion candidates. In Delaware, there's a candidate running for Senate. He's a Green Party candidate. The Libertarian Party is endorsing him. Um, and I've seen in Texas there's, like, a Libertarian running for Senate. He has a lot of Green Party support, actually, and Libertarian support. So... Let's think out of the box a little bit, people, and, and, and this might be, I mean, like Gary Johnson is in his campaign is even saying, be libertarian with me just for this one election. I mean, you know, let's not wait till, you know, we completely hit rock bottom. I, I mean, um, we're getting pretty close. Let's, let's not wait till it, you, you know, gets, you know, let's learn a little bit from the past, um, you know, not, not completely, which no one's perfect, but let's just try to pick up the pieces a little bit and at least salvage what we can and, you know, make things even better in the future. And uh, 
Dan, it's been great talking to you. I, I feel very um, more informed about like um, where you stand on issues, uh, more confident uh, because of I, I know where you stand on these issues. Um, that uh, you, you know you should be getting the support, um, and um, and you know I think hopefully the time has come. We'll see. I mean that's the great thing about our democracy. Nothing is taken for granted, and there's still election yet to happen. But um, if, if we can pr help propel enough people like you, maybe we can get, you know, about 50 or so people in the Congress um, this year. It's, it's, I think it's more realistic. Um, and we might not get everything we want or the presidential election. I hope we do. It could happen. All it is is a decision that needs to be made. Um, we don't need any money to do it. All we need is spread the word, and it's just a decision we need to make and, and, and just a little bit of effort, you know, to at least, you know, get a mail-in ballot if, if you can't make it because of your schedule and um so dan good talking to you i'll say goodbye to you uh, real quick um after this interview but thank you so much for your time sir and and being open and, and transparent and um and uh you know we do appreciate that sir thanks yeah thank you and it was a great opportunity i appreciate it